Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Spiritism talk series promoted by the United States Spiritist Federation every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. I'm very happy to host this talk today by Yuri Castro, who will be talking about mechanisms of gratitude. Let's all give Yuri a very warm welcome. And before he starts his presentation, allow me to introduce him. Yuri Castro is a licensed clinical psychologist specialized in the treatment of severe and persistent mental illnesses in adolescents and adults. He has been residing in Florida since 2013, is married and has two sons. Yuri has been involved in spiritism since an early age and started giving lectures in 2012. He is a volunteer at Conscious Living Spiritist Center in Northern Miami, Florida. Please take this opportunity to send your questions during the presentation using the chat window. Yuri has reserved time to address your comments and questions once he concludes his talk. Yuri, it's nice to have you here. Thank you, Peter, it's nice to be here. Great, so it's all yours. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I wanna start the talk on gratitude, thanking the USSF, thanking Peter, and thanking everybody involved for the, involved for the opportunity to be here. So the talk today is on the mechanisms of gratitude. Gratitude as a, an emotion, a sentiment, a feeling, has been, I believe, in the forefront of a lot of mental health uh, talks over the past two decades or even more. A lot of clinical interventions are focusing on gratitude or bringing a gratitude component to them. Um, there's a lot of posts about it in social media, talks on TED Talk or YouTube and things like that, emphasizing the need to be grateful. So in the talk today, I wanted to bring the mechanisms of gratitude. So how does gratitude work? What is gratitude? What is the spiritist view on gratitude and what can we learn from that first and foremost i want to talk about the etymology of the word so the word gratitude comes from the latin gratia gratus or gratitudo which is a state of being grateful uh, and like i said derived from the latin word which has the same meaning or even gratus which is to be thankful our dear dear friend and spiritual benefactor Joanna De Angelis, which we're going to be talking about her a lot in the in this lecture today, she says that gratitude stands out as one of the most relevant among the noble sentiments that characterize a psychologically mature individual. So we know that Joanna has this very um, interesting psychological vein, and she does bring a lot of the psychological knowledge and and especially from Jung and everything from her books and aligns that with spiritism. So it's, it's really, it's almost impossible to do a talk on gratitude through the lens of spiritism, I think, without even a, a small mention uh, from Joanna DeAngelis. But today we're going to be doing a lot of mentions on that. And the first book that we're going to be looking at today, and just a parenthesis here for those who have not seen my lectures, I like to live on the top right of the screen, the uh, biography, sorry, the bibli bibliography or where the source material came from, from that specific slide. So if you like the, the slide or if you like something that says there, it's already um, an incentive for you to go there and try to find the book yourself, read the book yourself. In this book called The Psychology of Gratitude by Joanna DeAngelis, psychographed by our dear, dear Devaldo Franco, uh, this is a book, as the name says, talks about the psychological components to gratitude or, or of gratitude through the spirits, uh, spiritism's lens. Uh, and I, just a parenthesis here as well, if you want to purchase this book, I'm going to ask them to put the link there because the, the Spiritist Group of New York uh, has this book available. Um, I, have, I have a copy of it here. You can't see because it's blurred. But I definitely, definitely recommend reading that book if you're interested in gratitude or even if you just want to read a good book. So Joanna talks about gratitude. 
as equal as being a part of, let's say, spiritual growth. So she says, and I, I brought this from the book, she says, it is important to be thankful for all the goodness one enjoys as well as for the vic vicissitudes that have not happened yet. But equally so is the gratitude one feels when difficulties do arise for one understands they happen for a reason and that they are necessary to one's process of spiritual growth as programmed in the law of cause and effect. So she's talking about us being grateful and thankful for the things, not only the good ones, but also the vicissitudes that not even that have not even happened yet. Because through the lens of spiritism, we learn that through our our spiritual growth goes through these stages per se. And a lot of these is embracing the new challenges for our spiritual depuration, for our spirit to become even more elevated after every incarnation that we have here. So she's talking about the spiritual growth and she's even mentioning, mentioning the law uh, of cause and effect. And the law of cause and effect, so as the name itself entails, brings us to question as well or to think about free will. What about our free will? And I put there, what about the soul uh, called free will? We are again free to do as we please and so we come here we reincarnate and we bring some challenges with us we bring some goals some things that we would like to improve but we're always free to change path we're always free to sometimes and we do sometimes deviate from those goals and from those challenges that we chose to embrace and to face so the spiritual growth goes through this law of cause and effect. So whatever it is that we do, if we deviate from our path, there's going to be a consequence. And the word consequence itself is neither good or bad. So we think about the consequence. If we sometimes have a vicissitude that we chose to come, like a trial or a tribulation or anything like that, that we chose to endure in this life, if we do better than perhaps what we even expected, there's going to be a consequence for that, a positive one. Same thing with the negative one. Sometimes we come here with certain limitations, and if we don't embrace them, if we don't accept them, if we try to go around that, we're going to face consequences. You know, Sometimes these uh, trials, they end up being pushed to next reincarnations or even for when we're in the spiritual plane because we didn't solve them here. So free will does play a role, but we're always governed by this law of cause and effect as she so often uh, talks about. Joanna also says that no one is born grateful, neither does one obtain gratitude in a leap. One learns gratitude through its practice, which must be initiated within the family, the society uh, in miniature, where affection expresses itself naturally. So she's saying no one is born grateful, neither does one obtain it in a leap. Nature does not work in leaps. Everything is gradual. It's a gradual process. Even with, if we think of a seed, a seed that's going to become a tree. It doesn't go through leaps. It goes through stages, very gradual progress. And so are we as spirits still evolving, still trailing our own paths to our own evolution. We also grow in stages, but these stages are very gradual. Progress is gradual. And if she's saying nobody, nobody's born grateful. The, this is a high... Uh, level emotion and something that we learn through practice. Gratitude for once apparent, uh, sorry, for one's apparent failures constitutes recognition in that the individual comprehends the disappointments are part of the learning process and their occurrence has a reason. So again, our failures, if we think about mistakes, mistakes are excellent teachers as long as we can absorb the lesson that they're teaching us. Because we are not perfect yet. So we're still learning. We're still trying to improve. Um, but the gratitude comes from those. The gratitude from those failures is useful when we learn from them. And we comprehend that these disappointments and everything has a reason. Sometimes, like I said, could be things that we have brought with us from our past life or from uh, when we chose to reincarnate. And sometimes are these things that we acquire here through 
are deviations of our paths, of, you know, the morals and everything. So she said that starts within us, she even mentioned in the slide before, like I said, like the family, which is a society in miniature. So uh, external peace, so external peace, it starts within us, so it starts internally. Uh, so it starts within each one, and so it is with gratitude. Instead of uh, fear of accepting it, let one be a spontaneous donor and become cured of all blemishes whilst rehearsing generalized harmony. Look how beautiful and how potent this passage is. It's for us to become, she's urging us, inviting us to become a spontaneous donor. And with that, it's going to come, like she said, the cure for all the blemishes whilst rehearsing generalized harmony. Of course, as we improve, People around us improve as well. Our outlook on life improves, but also externally, society in general, if we think about it, if everybody improves individually, the society as a whole is going to improve as well. And she says this one, she says this sentence here that I think is so important. She says, life without gratitude is sterile and void of ex existential meaning. So she's bringing the existential meaning here which is a little bit of a, a psychological concept into the arena of gratitude. So existential meaning. You don't need to be a psychologist to sort of understand what that may be, uh, what that may entail. And if we think about society in general, like I said, all the blemishes in our society and everything that's happening, existential meaning is sort of an important factor because how many mental health issues sometimes culminate that co sometimes culminate even in suicide they derive because of a lack of existential meaning which is oftentimes the seed for depression for the presogenic thoughts and all of those things that will end up snowballing and become something much much bigger that end up even like i said culminating in somebody taking their own life, taking their own opportunity that they chose to be in this world, in this moment. And she's saying that life without gratitude is void of existential meaning. So she's highlighting, emphasizing the importance of us to exercise, to internalize and, and externalize our gratitude so our lives are not sterile and void of existential meaning. But the, the reality uh, is that we oftentimes, uh, we only appreciate life after passing through dire conditions. Think of a sickness, a disease. Think of uh, an accident. Like how many times have we learned only by missing out on things that we had? And it doesn't need, doesn't need to be something big. Like if we talk about freedom, for instance, you don't need to um, go to prison or go to jail to to miss out on your freedom so if you i don't know if you break your leg or if you don't have a mean of transportation for some reason all those things that that rise from that all those complications that appear make you think wow i had that like i could walk freely i can i could do all these things and now i can't and i missed that and i wasn't even grateful for that i didn't realize i took it for granted and again we, it doesn't need to be uh something something big you know think of like having a virus in your body and i i'm still a little bit nasal i apologize because this week i was very sick i couldn't work for two days even and as i was you know thinking of this talk today of gratitude i i kept thinking how how many times have i not been grateful for having a healthy life but then a virus comes disrupts us disrupts our routine disrupts how we feel how we can operate and function and then we think all those days that I don't have this virus, that I'm not sick, and I haven't been grateful. So it is something that we can learn from. And Joanna says that gratitude is a blessing, albeit of unknown worth. Unknown worth. So she's saying that for now, we don't even, we, we probably can't even comprehend how much we are blessed you know, by all the things that surround us, all the things that we have. Um, and she says gratitude is a blessing. So having that sort of sentiment spontaneously arise within us is a blessing, 
of unknown worth. And it's unknown worth because we don't even comprehend just yet all of the benefits and everything that gratitude can bring, uh, can bring to our lives. So she says, to live is to practice gratitude for everything to which one is subjected and which one has the opportunity to experience. So she's saying to live is to practice gratitude for everything that we are subjective, uh, subjected to and or which we experience. So just being alive here in this planet, in this time, how many spirits are in the spiritual plane wanting to reincarnate, it, wanting that opportunity to continue their own growth, and their own path of redemption. And they are not granted that yet. We have been granted that. Those are incarnated that are watching this. We have been granted that. And to live is to practice gratitude every single day. Still in the book of Joanna DeAngelis, The Psychology of Gratitude, we look a little bit on the role of humility. So a few things on that. She says the stimulus propitiated by humility is one of the fundamental reasons for the expression of gratitude for it allows the individual to understand how much is being received from the free air one breathes to the noble autonomous phenomena of the organism that preserve our existence so she's talking about gratitude of from things such as the free air that we breathe and our organism, our body functioning the way that it functions without us even realizing. And we have all this machinery that's working to perfection. Our heart, our lungs, our stomachs, everything, our kidneys, everything, that's our, our brains, everything working in unison, in synchrony, in harmony. And we don't even realize. So she's, again, inviting us once more to be grateful uh, for this, these, these aspects. And she talks about, this is where humility is coming in as well. No one is, self, is so self-sufficient as to be completely independent of everything and everyone. So she's saying no one is so self-sufficient to be completely independent, meaning not having to rely on anybody else. Because as we know through spiritism, we reincarnate in a family for a reason. <laughs> we reincarnate in a certain place for a reason that, fits us, fits our evolutionary goals, and we're not self-sufficient. She's saying nobody is so self-sufficient that we don't depend on others for our own evolution. And she even goes on to say that an, uh, an arrogance, so the arrogance of thinking that we are self-sufficient, that we can isolate ourselves in a mountain and don't do anything and not talk to anyone ever again and continue on our path, she says that it's a reflection of our own fragility. So it is a reflection of our own um, immaturity still, spiritual immaturity. And she talks about the perception of humility, the stealing in one, a feeling of exhilaration when we realize that we're dependent on each other, on one another. And that is that is a great thing. And she says that such identification, which is the identification uh, born from humility, this identification that we do need each other um, leads to psychological maturation. And if we think of the, the gospel according to Spiritism, a book from, from Kardec, talks about, says, in all circumstances, Jesus put humility in the categories of virtues that bring men near to God. And that, is a, that is a very powerful thing. So humility plays a role in this gratitude. Um, and also, there is um, an author called, and we'll look at, at him in a second, called Martin Seligman, which is the forefather of positive psychology, um, very prolific author and psychologist. He, I, was, I was looking at an interview from a while back from him, and he was saying, he was talking about autobiography, and he said, my life is not an autobiography, it's a biography, because of everybody that has influenced me, and everybody that had con contributed to his life. Of course, he's, he's playing with the word. If, if we look from a, from a very semantic point of view, an autobiography, a writing about your own life, uh, it's possible. But he, I, I like the concept, the subjective piece that he brings, that we, there's no autobiography, there's biographies, because we all relate to each other. We all grow from one another. And here it is, Martin Seligman. Uh, and I also brought Brené Brown. So these are two uh, 
uh, people involved in a lot of research in the psychology field. And Brene Brown, she's done, she, she has talks on Netflix. She has numerous books. And she has, like I said, countless of research as well in this. And she's been doing this for a long time. And she, she talks in one of her books, uh, The Gifts of Imperfection from 2010. She talks about how she was researching for a while about the, the things that, leave pe le that lead people to feeling happy, for ha like about happiness she was researching. And over 12 years of research and over 11,000 pieces of data, she was looking at it and she was thinking, okay, I'm going to find that the people who are happy are grateful, right? Because that's kind of the logic. I'm happy. I'm grateful for the things that I have or everything that I am and etc. But she didn't find that people who were happy were grateful. It was the other way around. People who were grateful were happy. And it's a big difference right there. So not everybody that was technically happy was grateful. But people who were grateful had a higher happiness scores. And that was, that was an interesting plot twist there, we can say. And she even mentions that uh, the, these folks that scored high in the happiness level because they were very grateful, uh, they shared a common tangible gratitude practice, meaning they did something that was tangible, something that was objective to practice their gratitude, be it writing a letter, be it uh, saying that to someone. And we'll look at some of these that we can uh, later on. Martin Seligman, uh, in the book 2011, he mentions, again, also a lot of studies. He's, he's been doing studies since 2000s. Um, and he did a study talking about looking at the happiness score. So he looked at a couple of different aspects of, of happiness. Okay, so which one of these are highly associated with happiness? And they, he found that gratitude was the one that, was, that had the highest correlation with happiness scores. So the higher the gratitude, the higher the happiness scores. Um, and even he goes on to say that when the, the, had a, the participants had a weekly assignment, to write and personally deliver, personally deliver a letter of gratitude to someone who they never properly thank for, for their kindness, for their help, or whatever the circumstance may be. And he said that participants that did this exercise, that were brave enough to do this exercise, they exhibited a huge increase in the happiness scores. And this impact was greater, greater than that, than the impacts from any other intervention with benefits lasting for a month. So just that one action that they had increased because they did follow these people through a certain period of time. It, it lasted for over a month. So something that in theory, it's, it's small. It's, it's not so such a big thing that they're doing. Increase our happiness scores for, over, uh, for lasting for a month. So that's something for us to think about. And if we go even deeper into research, and we'll look at the neuroscience of gratitude. That's how I, I coined it here. I'm going to I'm bring a, a few studies that also talk about this. So one is from Komaze and colleagues from 2011. Uh, these are Japanese authors. So they did this research in Japan and they looked at gratitude exercises. So example, uh, coming up with lists. They can serve as a buffer, meaning like a protection and like changing your threshold for symptoms of depression. So like makes you... Like in, in, in easier terms, it makes you less uh, vulnerable to developing depression and positively affect the mental health uh, of workers from multiple areas. So they looked at workers from different areas and they were looking at well-being of these workers. And they found that doing these like lists of things that they were grateful for served as a buffer against depression and positively affect the mental health uh, of them. This other study from 2018 from Wong uh, looked at how people who wrote letters showed greater neural sensitivity in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is this part right here in our forehead, uh, seen through a function of magnetic resonance imaging, the fMRI, that looks at how, how our, our, what areas of our brain, our brain are being activated. And this brain area here, the prefrontal uh, cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, is associated with learning and decision making. It's actually it's associated with it's a rewards pathway too. It's associated with a lot of executive functioning. Um, so these greater neural sensitivity there because of these letters of gratitude that these people were writing. So we're looking at 
the impacts of gratitude from a neurological standpoint even, which is extremely uh, interesting and should encourage us to practice gratitude even more. And he said, they, through the study, that this effect was found three months after the letter writing began. So three months after even. So we're talking about an effect that is that has lasted like quite some time from them writing these letters and activating that part and improving these executive functioning uh, mechanisms. And this one here from 2003 is a little older, but it's such an interesting one. They asked participants to write a few sentences uh, each week, and they had three different groups. Okay, so one group uh, wrote about things that they were grateful that had that had occurred during the week. So write about something that happened this week that you're grateful for. The other group wrote about daily irritations or things that had displeased them. And the third one wrote about events that had affected them. So they didn't say affected you negatively or positively, just something that affected you. So something they were grateful, something that displeased them. And the other group was just something that affected you. So after 10 weeks, so they looked at oh, no, almost uh, three months, those who wrote uh, about gratitude were more optimistic. They exercised more and had, had fewer visits uh, to the doctor. So they had fewer visits to the doctor, but this is this is over a period of a few months, not only like the 10 weeks. After a while, because again, they follow, it's a longitudinal study. They follow these people afterwards for, I think, for quite some time even. And they found that had all these positive effects. So we don't need to go, actually. To in deep into the, the realms of, of research and, and psychological and neuroscience literature to find about the effects on our brains and our on our bodies that uh, gratitude can help us with. Joanna, in this book here, The Psychology of Gratitude, she says that the habit of being grateful through its own repetition, so meaning through practice, through repetition, equilibrates the discharges of adrenaline and noradrenaline. While cortisol maintains its control over these chemical substances, thus neutralizing any possible excesses that would consequently produce alterations of the glycemic levels and the cardiac rhythm. So she's talking about biological components here from the habit of being grateful, which is achieved, and I underline there, through repetition, ha habits or behaviors repeated over time. That's what it is. So when we create this habit and we repeat the behavior of being grateful over time, these that behavior, that habit can help us, you know, level our glycemic levels and the cardiac rhythm. So she also talks about improvements in cholesterol levels, sleep, self-esteem, arterial pressure, reduction of anxiety, anger, depression, stress. So there are many, many benefits that we see that we have from being grateful, from the habit and the practice of being grateful. And this is, again, through the lens of spiritism, you know, by our, our dear benefactor, Joanna DeAngelis. And we learn then that gratitude is an act of love. So Christ said, love each other as I have loved, as I have loved you. And we know how hard that is to love each other as he had loved us because he loved us with a love that we cannot yet comprehend or achieve, but at least for us to think about and try, that that is our path. That is what we must focus on. And we learn through spiritism as well that with love, the spirits help each other. And this help creates a bond of gratitude between those spirits because the spirits learn and they know that one person helped the other, and they both became better, and they both grew from that. And as we've seen from multiple books in the Spiritist literature, we can, we can look at André Luiz, Emmanuel, no person is impermeable to a gesture of love, a gesture of kindness, or sincere gratitude. And we have seen through the reports from these uh, spirits how many spirits there are, discarnate spirits, or even incarnate spirits, that are so rooted in hatred and everything, but with gratitude, with gesture of love and kindness, that dissolves the hatred and they change. Joanna talks then about this difficult aspect, as we already 
touched a little bit upon, which is the gratitude for challenges. So she says the challenge to gratitude actually happens in times of difficulties when adversities appear, since they are a part of the demanding process of evolution. We will evolve through challenges. We have already. We got to a point in our evolution that we have already evolved through our challenges, through the challenges that we have faced and we have uh, overcome and conquered. But this is it. She says the challenge of gratitude is the meaning that it's so hard to be grateful to challenges. But when we realize that it is, those, uh, those challenges are the things that are going to propel us forward in our own evolution, then we, we look at things through a different perspective and we start to realize that maybe we should be grateful for them because the challenges are themselves an opportunity for growth. And in the book, Paul and Stephen, we have the great apostle Paul. He, he was at, at one point, he had a thing, he, he and um, I forgot who he, who he was with, but they were, they were punched. They were like, beaten and everything and, and and paul was showing like some happiness after being beaten up beaten up and everything and he says cry uh jesus deemed, deemed me worthy of this look how how beautiful that change in perspective is that he was worthy of that difficult challenge that difficult challenge that he had fa had to face and that is that is a, a change in perspective that we can use and we even had Joanna talk about this in her book. Uh, St. Augustine said this, harsh trials, hear me well, almost always indicate an end of suffering and of an improvement for the spirit when they are accepted out of love for God. Look how great that is. Harsh trials, you know, they indicate, almost always indicate an end of suffering and improvement for the spirit, meaning when we're reaching that point, when the, the trials are harshest is because we earned those challenges. We earned those harsh trials. And that's a good, that's a good sign in a way, because as he's saying, almost always in the canon end of suffering and an improvement for the spirits when they're accepted out of love for God. So it's when they're truly, truly accepted. And Joanna even says, because human skies will not be, will not be always will not always be adorned with stars. And that is true. Sometimes we'll see a lot of rain, a lot of overcast weather, and a lot of thorns in our path, and a lot of stones. And that's the reality of life. That's how we are right now. So this book called Harvest of Light, unfortunately, we still don't have that in English. Hopefully we will one day. But there's two messages here that talk about gratitude for adversaries. And I think this, I wanted to to bring them here anyways, just because I feel like they also complement very well the lecture today. So the message number seven talks about appreciate your friends, appreciate your friends, thanking them for their company. However, never despise your opponents or underestimate their importance. So she's saying, uh, sorry, Emmanuel here. So this was psychographed by Chico, by Emmanuel. Emmanuel is saying, thanking our friends, you know, always thank, thank our friends, appreciate them. But don't despise your opponents or don't underestimate the value that they have in our own, in our own evolution, in our own path. And the message uh, number 56 says, pray to God to bless you, but reconcile yourself every morning with all creatures and with all things, thanking them for the gifts or lessons they offer you. So every morning, reconcile yourselves with this idea and thanking the, the 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 adversaries and every person that cross our path for the gifts or lessons they offer you and this is very very hard very very hard because we're still we're still ungrateful a lot of the times i'm not going to say for the most part because i don't know everybody that's watching this but for the mo a lot of the times we're very ungrateful and you know it's hard to be grateful for adversaries we sometimes we want them out of our way is less stress for us, you know, but we must be grateful for them as well. This is what he's urging us to do so we can learn from the lessons that they are offering us, even if they don't realize. And again, this is a change in perspective that can mean a world of difference. The gospel according to spiritism 
in this part that talks about gratitude to our dear Father, the Heavenly Father, says, on lifting up our soul to God each night, assuming in prayer, we should remember in our innermost self the many favors that He has granted us during the day and offer thanks for them, for all of these favors that He had, has granted us. But most specifically, at the moment we receive the effects of his goodness and protection, we should spontaneously bear witness to our gratitude. So the gratitude is, is going to flourish in us and being grateful to our dear Heavenly Father for everything, all the gifts that we have uh, received. For this, it continues, it is enough that we direct a thought attributing the benefit to him without even interrupting our work. So it's saying here just a thought, which we know takes no time at all. But when done with purpose, one thought we know can create, our thoughts can modulate, destroy, mediate, can do wonderful things and very dire things too, depending on how we use our thoughts, which is these tools that we have acquired through our evolution. But that's, that's for, for another talk. Uh, but only a thought, towards God with sincere gratitude without even interrupting our work is already a pass, uh, uh, sorry, a, um, a step in the right direction. You know, and so meaning it doesn't take a lot of effort or time to be thankful. That's basically what they're saying here and encourage us to do. What about the absence of gratitude? When that lacks, uh, and as I said, a lot of times we're very ungrateful uh, and we're showing gratitude. So what does Joanna have to say about that? And she, she brings a diff uh, an interesting analogy here. She says that its absence, meaning the absence of gratitude, is replaced by an, emo an emotional termite that devours the individual from inside out, much like that social insect which finds in dead or alive plants a means of nourishment, eating them up voraciously and it, as it consumes them. So she's saying about an emotional termite. So if we imagine like the absence of gratitude or the, the ungratefulness that sometimes we, we have and we experience, almost like as a termite. So like devouring the individual from inside out. So that's something for us to be very, very mindful of. And there's this passage in the Bible in the chapter 17 of Luke um, about the 10 lepers. So a lot of you have, I may have learned about this or have um, seen it. And so I'm going to read verbatim because I don't want to paraphrase <laughs> that. So it says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. And I'm going to pause the passage here to talk about how it, back then people who had, you know, the, the leprosy, which it's not even that name anymore, but people had leprosy back then, as it says here, they used to stay away because of the contagious effect of that, that, so, that harsh disease. So they used to stay away. And in that society at that time, having leprosy was not just, um, a scourge of the body it was for the soul as well and for the social life because people who had leprosy was say, were seen for m most of that society at that time as impure of, of um, sinners. So they were excluded. And can we imagine the pain of having those, those wounds in the body grow, 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 and then also being excluded from everyone you love, from everybody? looking at you, and so it, it was a great, great pain. So that's why they're saying, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when Jesus said, go see the priests, is because the, the priests were like responsible also for this, the, 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 the understanding these aspects of sanitation, perhaps we can say like that. So they could see that they were healed and they could be accepted back into society because they didn't have leprosy anymore. So then Jesus said, you know, uh, go show yourselves to the priests. And, and as they went, they were healed. They were cleansed of their leprosy. Now continuing, now continuing with the passage here. It says, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. 
and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, to the, the Samaritan, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So your faith has healed you. And he understood what that meant. The other nine probably did not. And that's why Jesus was saying, well, where, where are the other nine? It's just one. I healed ten. I mean, ten were cleansed. Where are the other nine? And this passage has many, you know, many people can interpret it in different ways. But one of the ways we can bring to the talk on gratitude is for us to be thankful for things that sometimes happen to us that we, we realize or we don't even realize their magnitude. So my question is a subjective question, perhaps, is how many times have we been one of those nine? How many times have we have we received a blessing from an ailment or we have seen a blessing in general and we have not thanked God or we have not been thankful for that blessing specifically? So how many times have we been one of those nine? So that's a question that I pose and each, and each person will have their own answer. The Spirit's book in the talk about, in this, this topic of ingratitude or of being ungrateful, uh, the question number 1937, sorry, 937 says, are not the disappointments that are caused by ingratitude and by the fragility of early earthly friendships also a source of bitterness of the, of the human heart? Are we not disappointed when we are faced with gratitude? Yes, absolutely. But the spirits are saying, but we teach you, to feel pity for the ungrateful and for faithless friends. Their unkindness will do more harm to themselves than to you. Ingratitude comes of selfishness, and he who is selfish will meet sooner or later with hearts as hard as his own has been. Remember the law of cause and effect, everything having a consequence. So he's saying that those who are ungrateful perhaps suffer more than we suffer. And they will be met with ingratitude as well. Uh, like they're saying here, with hearts as hard as their own. And it continues by saying, Remember that Jesus himself during his life was scoffed at, despised, and treated as a knave and an imposter. And do not be surprised that you should be treated in the same way. If Jesus was treated that way, how, who are, with all his... His grandeur, all his magnitude, all everything that he he is and he represented. Why do we think we're going to be treated differently? So they're saying, let the consciousness of the good you have done be your recompense in your present life, and do not trouble yourself about those to whom you have you have done it. So again, talking about how we we should go on and not trouble ourselves with the ingratitude so much, and remembering that. Jesus uh, was faced with a lot of a lot of ingratitude, and even in a message, 170 from uh, the Way, the Truth, and the Life, which is a book psychographed by Chico, uh, by our benefactor Emmanuel, talk, talking about Jesus, um, says the ingratitude of those who received his benefits did not cause him to despair. Jesus never despaired, even when he saw that there was so much ingratitude for everything he has done. Moreover, uh, going back to the, the gospel according to spiritism, still on the, on the lack of gratitude, if we were to register day by day the many benefits we received without even, having ha without even having asked for them, we would be greatly surprised to perceive there are so very many that we have swept from our minds that we have not even, for, like we have forgotten and would feel ashamed of our ingratitude. So we, if we stop to make a list of everything that we could be grateful for during our day, they're saying, and it's true, we're going to be ashamed that, oh my God, I didn't realize that that happened. And this is, this is good. Even the, like I said, even the challenges as well. And we received so much without even having to ha ask for the planet that we inhabit, nature, the air that we breathe, the body that works so well for us and for our purpose. And on the book, Our Daily Bread, 
which is part of the Living Spring Collection, psychographed by Chico, by Emano as well. Uh, by our spirits, Emano is psychographed by Chico. Talks about, this is message number 11, uh, the good is tireless. And says, the sincere di di dis disciple, sorry, the sincere disciple, is well aware of the fact that Jesus has performed his ministry of love tirelessly ever since the beginning of the planet's formation. Regarding our own personal cases, the master very often must have felt the thorn of our ingratitude at seeing our retreat before the work of our own illumination. Christ's patience has never become exhausted at observing our willful and criminal detours. And he lovingly corrects us and constructively tolerates our faults, opening his merciful arms to us for renewing endeavors. So how many times have we been ungrateful and our ingratitude has been this thorn and the master is there for us. It's always going to be there for us, opening, like it said there, his merciful arms in these renewing endeavors because we all make mistakes. We're still going to make mistakes. We have made mistakes, but it's how we learn from them and how we evolve from them. And Jesus is, is waiting for us in our evolution, and he's still, his arms are wide open, as it says there. But the ingratitude from others is something that still hurt us. And thinking about it too, the gospel according to Spiritism says, those who seek reward on earth for the good they have done will not then receive it in heaven the rewards okay however god will esteem all who do not seek their rewards here on earth because all of this is gonna pass everything we have right now material things are gonna pass and basically the seeking those rewards or seeking those things that are ephemeris are not gonna be the true the true um Puzzles or the true the true uh, steps for us in our evolution. You should always help the weak, although knowing beforehand that you will receive no thanks for your help. But you can always be sure that if the person to whom you did a service forgets, God will take this even more into account than if the beneficiary had paid their debt. Basically, gratitude serves to test our persistence in doing good. And the ability here that we have to still be grateful and still help the people, but not expect anything back from them. And those who have not paid us, paid us back could be with a thank you. It doesn't need to be with a, a, a like money or anything like material. Um, it's saying here that we can always be sure that God is, is taking that into account. Everything that we do has a consequence and nothing goes without a consequence. So when we receive ingratitude and we're not paid for the benefit or the help that we have done to someone, it's okay because that is being accounted for. It's just not perhaps in our fragile and still uh, evolving eyes. This is another book from that hasn't been translated yet and talking about the ingratitude from others. We learn that ingratitude has roots in selfishness and pride, selfishness and pride. A lot of spiritist uh, material, a lot of books from spiritism talk about these being the, the scourges of our current evolutionary state, these two things that we must conquer and fight in order to evolve. Wherever there is the possibility of being useful, let us move forward with a strong spirit, building good, even if faced with irony, coldness, or ingratitude. Because according to the enlightened word of the apostle of the Gentiles, Paul, God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and moderation. And this is message uh, number 31. So we must rise above the ingratitude, ours from others. We must rise above that and become more grateful beings for everything that we have. And even the, like I said, the good and the bad. And an imperfect, we do have, though, an imperfect intuition of the past, you know, because of the, the veil of forgetfulness due to reincarnation. But even then, when we have that little glimpse of the path that we must take, that person that we is in our family, perhaps we, uh, we can't get along or we can't, you know, reason with, 
that's where it lies the the gratitude the love the for, like forgiving all of those things that we're going to learn is through those challenges and society family is a challenging aspect so i brought some tools here for us to think about gratitude and for us to perhaps start exercising our gratitude so these are a few ideas uh, that we can think about and maybe even implement so this is the toolbox for us to practice get gratitude. So one thing we can do is have a gratitude journal for those who like to write. This could be pen and paper or this could be uh, on your phone, pulling up like a, a notepad or something. And every night writing about something that was positive about your day or something that was, and by positive, I mean something that uh, you're grateful for. It could be a challenge. It could be a challenging task in your work, in your family, something you're grateful for, you know, in your day. So you write that. Another thing you can do is grateful contemplation. So for five to 10 minutes every day without distraction, stopping and contemplating mentally. So thinking about it because we know the power of thought, something that you're grateful for, but in a very specific day and like really thinking about how that something affected you, how that something helped you grow, helped you see things from a new perspective, perhaps. So it's called contemplating, meaning to think about grateful contemplation. The other one is to give thanks. So make an effort during your day to thank those that do, did something for you. So making a conscious effort to find these opportunities to give thanks and thank people that help you, however that may be. A gratitude letter. So write a letter or an email in the area of technology. You can see an email to someone you appreciate or to someone that did something good for you or something that helped you. And this is, the, this, is the, this is the interesting piece. You can choose to deliver the letter or not, or to send that email or not. Recommend you do, but if you don't, the exercise is still valid. So writing a letter of gratitude for someone. The other one is a great gratitude conversation. So with someone else, take turns. So you go with somebody else and you take turns naming three things that you're grateful for during the day. So meaning... Uh, and you guys talk about it. Okay, so I'm grateful for this because of that, 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 you know, and the other person goes. So each person names three things. So if you have like a partner or uh, children or, you know, like sons and daughters or whoever you want to be doing this with, you can have this conversation that's going to foster that feeling and that sense of gratitude. Or last and but not least, you can do, go on a mindfulness walk. There's another word that has been the forefront of a lot of mental health talk, mindfulness, right? Mindfulness meditation, mindful this. You can go on a mindfulness walk and walk, which, which means going outside, enjoying nature, whatever you are, um, or even you know, looking at your window, porch, whatever it may be. Going on this mindful walk and appreciating and being grateful for the nature around you. So focusing on, I'd say focusing on your senses. What can you see? What can you smell you know what can you hear and like all these things that nature provides us even the air that we breathe like i said and being grateful for that being mindful because when we're being mindful of those things gratitude will come as a consequence too if we think of everything that we receive so those are some tools some um things that we can try and i have one option that i highly recommend and i gave i gave this talk in a center here in florida in um, around thanksgiving and one of two people, two people actually from there, they utilize this this option here and they said that they like it. So I'm gonna share that with you guys. It's called the gratitude jar. Okay. So this one is you can write, get have like post-it notes, grab a jar, and every night before you go to bed, write something on a post-it note, something that you're grateful for. And doesn't need to be a diary, doesn't need to be something big. Could be even say like my, I don't know, my cat or a Something short could be, okay? So you write that on a post-it note, take that post-it note, fold it, put it in the gratitude jar. Then on the last day of, and you do that for every day of the month, okay? If you have a partner, you guys can take turns or you can both do it as well. On the last day of the month, open the jar and read your post-it notes. So it's going to be, we call double dipping, right? Because when you're writing about something you're grateful, you're already exercising on your specific day. One, because Joanna said about the habit coming from repetition, right? So if you do it every day, or if you can do it every day, one is you're being grateful as you're thinking about 
something that happened in your day or something you're grateful for. Two, so you're, you're exercising gratitude. So you put it, you put it there in the post-it note. So you do that, that repetition. So at the end of the month, when you open that jar, you're going to read your post-it notes. So it's double dipping because then you're going to be remembering those things that happened throughout the month that you're grateful for. And again, remember the studies that I said that these things can last a month or even longer. You're going to have that going on. So it's double dipping because then you're going to remember those things and you're going to be grateful again because you're remembering the things you're grateful for and then do the same for the following month. So that is a very practical option that we can all have as, as we've seen how important gratitude is for our bodies, our minds, our spirits. And we have seen not only the view of science and psychology, neuro, neuro, neuropsychology as well, but also through the lens of spiritism, how everything is interconnected, how gratitude is a pathway to love, is an act of love, which is the higher of all sentiments and all emotions so then for us to practice that is very important because as joanna said there's no there are no leaps it's it's a gradual process and by doing something like this exercising our gratitude we're gonna have impacts in our minds on our bodies in our spirits and with that i am very grateful for being here today and for uh, having the the opportunity and the space to give the stocks and i wish everybody a have um, a blessed week. Thank you, Yuri, for your very inspiring presentation. We will start our Q&A session soon, but first I have some announcements. First, Introduction to Mediumship, a free virtual course for beginners. The U.S. Spiritist Federation is thrilled to invite individuals eager to explore um, the realm of spirit communications according to spiritism. Check out the new course at learn.spiritist.us or scan the QR code on the flyer. The first module of lessons has been released. The second module of lessons will be coming out very soon on April 15th. Second, please check out the podcast-like series, Psychology and Spirituality, A Bridge to a Better Life Based on the Works by Joanna DeAngelis. A new episode appears every Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. It is available on YouTube and Spotify. Third, the Spiritist app, Be My Hope, is available now on the App Store or on Google Play. This app offers uplifting content in a collection of videos, daily messages, and audio materials. Download it now. And finally, on the screen, please note there is a QR code. If you want to help the USSF promote uh, produce and, and promote spiritism to everyone, please scan the QR code on the screen for your donation. Next, we will address comments or questions from the audience. There is still time for you to send in yours. Okay, let's see what we have here from the U.S. Spiritist Federation. Do you have any advice for how to cultivate gratitude in our lives when we come from families that were very abusive and therefore hard to forgive? Great question, Peter. This is, it's, it's very, very hard to cultivate gratitude or cultivate these positive feelings when we have been bombarded by, by trauma and like, a, like families, like it's saying, they're abusive families, which are very hard to forgive because still of our imperfect state of, of our spirits. So the advice to cultivate forgiveness, oh, sorry, gratitude there, I believe goes through one, the, the knowledge of one, one is truly internalizing the benefits that gratitude can have. It's not a one uh, size fits all, and it's not a one and only thing that will help but it is something that will help mentally like i said biologically spiritually that those who have been in abusive families and are struggling to forgive to start 
small. That's the best advice I can give. Start small. Don't try to embrace everything or do grandiose acts of, of gratitude or try to, um, like I said, embrace everything because there are all these other issues that will come up. But just being grateful by things, perhaps, like I said, the air we breathe or things that are not necessarily related to the trauma, you're going to start to develop that sort of habit. And eventually, hopefully, the gratitude is going to come be, uh, 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 to the, is going to be grateful to the trials and having a family that was abusive, you know. Thank you. Yeah, very important point because it's something to struggle with. And uh, as you were mentioning about nature, it happens slowly. So starting in small amounts is, yeah, is a good, yeah. good point. Okay, we have a question from Kirsten. <laughs> Yuri, hi, Kirsten. Hi, Yuri. Kirsten. <laughs> Yuri, can you share how parents can teach their children about gratitude? Excellent question. Um... And as, I, as I've said in my talk at, at Baltimore, Kirsten, more is caught than taught with kids, meaning they observe a lot what we do. So our, it's through our own example. So my, my one word answer would be example. So as parents, when we want to teach our kids gratitude, it doesn't matter if we just tell them, oh, write a letter, write a post-it note every day to our kids. So we are grateful, but they don't see us practicing gratitude. They don't see us being thankful for the things that surround us, for everything that we have and everything that we have avail available to us. So my advice for parents, if they want to teach their kids, uh, especially young, you said young children, which is even more interesting, about gratitude is through small actions, small acts, and just saying, oh, look, look how nice it is outside today. Wow, this is nice. And observing these things like, Look how how nice the sun is shining today. We have this warmth here. Isn't it good? You know, like just having that sort of talk to the child that will help them appreciate and foster that curiosity and that sense of like, yeah, this is nice that we have this. Oh, look how good we have food in our table. Oh, let's let's be thankful for that. You know, thank God we have food in our table and this and that. So through example, through this talk, you know, this is how you teach children gratitude. I did listen to a parent recently who said basically that that when when the children are grumpy get them to focus on something that's positive that they are truly thankful for yeah okay next question this is from daniel hi daniel if you are reincarnated and have no memory of your past life how can you be grateful for the lessons learned or good deeds done in that previous life being being grateful for the lessons learned and good deeds done in the previous life because we have no memory because like i said the veil of forgetfulness just the fact that we are here daniel and we have everything that we have and i don't mean material things solely i mean what we are who we are and what we have at our disposal in this time of uh, evolutionary transition of our planet already talks about that we have trailed a path and we have done good deeds in, in before we have so to be here, you know, especially to be involved like in spiritism and learning all these th these things, we can be grateful for our past selves without even knowing what, what we did. But if you think about everything that we possess, like I said, people like intelligence, health, all these things were conquered through tribulations and trials from our past lives. So we can be grateful just with the knowledge that even though I don't remember what I did, the fact that I have all these things that are the, all these blessings in my life meant that I did. I already overcame a few challenges to be here today, and in the in the in the way that I am. Good point. Okay, next question from Kirsten again. Also, Yuri, can you speak to why those who suffer from clinical anxiety and depression have a harder time practicing gratitude, and how can they overcome this? Mm -hmm. Also, great question. So, anxiety, depression, like all these mental mental ailments that we we have in our society today, and they're higher than almost ever. Um, it is very hard to practice gratitude because with anxiety, if we think about 
uh, generalized anxiety disorder, which is this intense anxiety about things that are going to come. So about the future, if we think about major depressive disorder, you know, like, so these, these conditions are very serious and they, one, they require help. So I do recommend um, therapy for that, uh, if need be, even like psychiatry. But it's very hard for them to product, to be grateful because of the symptoms. It's hard to be, and like I said before, I was sick this week, so I'm, now I'm even more grateful for my health. And sometimes I'm, I forget about it because I'm just healthy normally. But people who, are, who have struggled and battled with anxiety and depression, we can only imagine that like how much they have faced and like those symptoms get in the way because they take over our mental space, our energy, our sentiments, are worried about, are, are focused on um, anxiety about the future, anxiety about being judged by others or depression, thinking that nothing's going to change, hopelessness, uh, depressed mood, anhedonia, and all those symptoms that come and make it so hard for us to function at all, you know, in general, I mean, and also be grateful because being grateful is through the habit and understanding that we need to try to be grateful. But it's hard to be grateful when life is so gloom. So, to the second part of your question, how they can how they can overcome this is taking very very small baby steps towards gratitude, similar to what I said with the children, and also, and I do have to emphasize this, getting help, clinical help, um, if need be, to help them overcome those depressive symptoms or those anxious symptoms. Boy, we should never hesitate to get professional help, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, next question from the International Spiritist Council. Does our capacity for gratitude only develop through our free will? Or do we usually learn more deeply when gratitude is imposed on us? Good question. So I think that our capacity for gratitude is there. It doesn't depend on free will. I think what free will will do or what it does is it's the means to an end. So it is the way we can exercise our gratitude. We all have the capacity for love. We all have the capacity for forgiveness and for gratitude and all those things. But sometimes because of a free will, we don't exercise them. But we all have the capacity for that. We do. We are beings of light. We are created from the love of God. And we do have that in us. So to practice gratitude, the free will is going to be the what we can do with our time here and with the, the means we have at our disposal to become grateful. And the question about learning more deeply when gratitude is imposed, I'm not so sure about that one. I'm, I don't I don't know if if there are ways that we can learn more deeply when anything is imposed on us. You know, it's, and if I if I take the word imposed and I even think it more broadly, I can think of us imposing some challenges on ourselves as we reincarnate. So yes, then we're gonna cultivate gratitude. But as for a lot of things in life, and those who have children will see this, have, have know this. When you try to impose or force something, it usually can backfire, and you can even develop something that's gonna be negative in the end. So like if you're trying to force your your child, like if you don't write a post-it note on gratitude every day, you're not going to have this or that or that. Like they're going to become resentful of having to do that activity, which is the, the opposite of what we want to foster. So I'm a little careful with imposing anything. <laughs> okay. Let's see what the next question is. From the United States Spiritist Federation. Since gratitude is so liberating and essential for our well-being, it is tragic and frustrating that many people struggle with or resist the practice of gratitude. Any thoughts? It is tragic. It is tragic um, that people struggle and resist. And I think a lot of that resistance also comes from a lack of true knowledge, a lack of understanding. That's why I wanted to bring to the lecture today the spiritist uh, view on it, but also a scientific view on it, also a psychological view on it. So we can see that there are many, many fields, there are many, many um, routes that tell us that gratitude is very helpful. And it is something that we will, and I already said, we have the capacity for that, that we will learn one way or another to put in our lives. So because gratitude is an act of love. 
So it is very tragic that we see nowadays all of the numbing of our of our feelings and our emotions, our senses, and just the way you know all the negative things that are happening in society today. Uh, it is tragic because gratitude could help alleviate a lot of the pain of the existential, as you saw with Joanna DeAngelis, the existential meaning. It would bring a lot of existential meaning in our life when we practice gratitude. So my thoughts for that is to start small, again, gradual, choose something. That's why I wanted to bring different options too. Choose something that fits you, something that speaks to you, and then practice gratitude through that. Okay, thank you. Next question. From the United States Spiritist Federation. Should we feel ashamed when we do not feel much gratitude? I don't think we should, but I think we do feel ashamed. <laughs> I think it's it's inherent to us. And again, our still are imperfect states, but uh, that we feel ashamed that we're not grateful. Oh my God, all these things. If we were to list, as the gospel according to Spiritism said, if we were to list everything we're we're grateful to have or we should be grateful to have we're gonna feel ashamed for not being grateful for all those things so i think it's it's a consequence of our ingratitude which is a reflection of still uh, our evolutionary stage but it is um it is something that since we're gonna feel ashamed anyways let's use that and try to be more grateful so that's that's my positive spin on that and our conscience does help us to wake up too Okay, uh, a comment from Kirsten to Santos. There's another great technique called open when letters. So write yourself a letter when you are feeling grateful to be read at a later time when you are feeling down or less grateful. Any thoughts? Yes, I recommend that one, Kirsten. <laughs> that is a good one too. And then so it's, it's a pick me up in a ways, but also again, it's gonna be, a way to practice gratitude because it comes slowly it's gradual but we need to put into practice so that is yet we had six i, I brought six tools plus the jar the jar now you guys that are watching this we have eight techniques that you can use to uh practice gratitude the open win letter that that kirsten so lovingly shared with us and a comment from mark carlos indeed it is a privilege to be alive in this time of the Earth's evolution. So many blessings humans take for granted each day, especially in the United States of America. Agreed, Mark. Uh, I think that it is a privilege to be alive, like I said, too. You know, so I, I think that just being alive is enough for us to be grateful because there are so many spirits that want to reincarnate that need and want and it's just it, it doesn't happen like that so we are here today because we chose to be here and who knows how long we waited who knows how long we worked on ourselves in the spiritual plane to be here so being here having this opportunity to do different is a blessing in itself and a comment from laura chrisatomo excellent talk yuri I got a few ideas for our family spiritist retreat event that will offer some tools to help our mental health. The gratitude jar is an excellent idea. Thank you, Laura. Yes, I, I, I that's my, my, as you can see, probably that's one slide for that. That's my favorite one because it also has, and we do it here in our house too, it has a very nice visual impact as well. So especially if you do like post-its with different colors, it becomes something like beautiful and like like uh, upbeat that you have in your house that you look at that and you're already looking at that, you know that that's a gratefulness, like the uh, gratitude jar. So, yes. <laughs> okay. And thank you, Yuri. And thank you, everyone who has joined us for the today's live. We appreciate everyone who follows our weekly Spiritist Talks. Next Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Don't miss our next live when Leah Govia will be discussing the topic, The Spirit's Book, Guidance for the New Era. All right, and we will close with a prayer. So if you can, please close your eyes. Dear God, 
We are thankful for life. We are thankful for the opportunities we have each and every day. We are thankful for our talents, thankful for the journeys we have been given. May each of us have the strength and the fortitude to make the most of our time, to try and understand who we are, and to help one another. We are thankful for the support that we receive in a variety of ways. And may we each and every day appreciate this gift. Amen. Thank you, everyone, and have a blessed weekend. Thank you. Thank you.